Hi, I'm Rich Heller, and welcome to the Rich in Relationship podcast. And today we are interviewing Ken Cloak, who is a world recognized mediator, dialogue facilitator, conflict resolution systems designer, teacher, trainer, author, and public speaker. And he's been a pioneer and leader in the field of mediation and conflict resolution for at least 37 years. How are you today, Ken? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you here on the show. My pleasure, thank you for inviting me. And uh, before we started, Ken, you were just sort of getting me up to date on what you've been doing. And actually, I think let's start with that piece about what do you think about the political dialogue in the United States today? Well, actually, there isn't much dialogue. Um, there, are, uh, there are serial monologues um, and there are debates, and we distinguish debates from dialogues within the field of conflict resolution. Debate is about winning, um, and because it's about winning, it means that somebody else has to lose, and mm -hmm. because of the format, uh, it becomes possible to um, win for reasons that have nothing to do at all with uh, whether you're right or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, in dialogue, on the other hand, the emphasis on learning and on problem solving. And you have the possibility of maybe win-win in, in a dialogue. Exactly right. Uh, in fact, um, that's usually what happens because you've come out of it. Uh, you've asked a, a set of questions that don't have a single correct answer. So if we think of your audience right now, we could ask members of your audience three categories of questions. The first category of question is, um, who among the people who are listening in uh, is the oldest person listening in? Who's the youngest? Who's the tallest? Who's the shortest? Who lives the closest to where this is being broadcast from? Who lives the farthest away? And now we can see that there is a single correct answer for everyone. Second category of question is, how tall are you? How old are you? Where do you live? And now there's a single correct answer for each individual person. Mm -hmm. Third category of question, uh, what issues are you facing at whatever age you are at? What does your height mean to you? Um, uh, what do you love about where you live? And what do you really not like about where you live? And now we've got multiple correct answers for each individual person. Mm -hmm. And this third uh, set of questions are by far the most interesting. So what's needed in dialogue, in political dialogue especially, is to ask questions that do not have a single correct answer. So the usual question we ask is, who do you support? Are you in favor or are you against? And those are digital questions and they give rise to a single correct answer. Right. But if instead we ask an interest-based question, like, why is that important to you? What does that mean to you? What life experiences have you had that have led you to feel so deeply and passionately about this issue? Then we get a different set of issues and all of a sudden then dialogue becomes possible. Yeah, it opens up a whole new, it can open up a whole new world instead of the world of yes and no. Yeah, in coaching, we, they tell us open-ended questions. Always ask open-ended questions. And when you're, when you're working with, as a, when, you're, when I'm working with people individually, every now and then I find myself slipping into yes or no land and I have to stop, say, wait a minute, that was a terrible question. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Great. And actually, it's amazing how after, I mean, I'm pretty thoroughly coached and trained myself, how easy it is to slip into uh, yes and no. Yes. And so it's no wonder that it happens in the political arena. Well, the political arena has actually been set up in such a way as to produce those kinds of answers. But the, the important part is to see that that isn't necessary in order to do what politics is actually there to do. And fundamentally, if you look at it over a period of history and you go back to Aristotle and people like this, uh, Aristotle's definition of politics was very simply a search for the highest common good. Mm -hmm. Well, what's wrong with that? And the answer is really nothing except the way that we go about doing it which is to assume that um, there is one single common good for everyone that actually represents what is good for one group and not good for another. Mm -hmm. 
So in order to get what Aristotle is describing, there has to be dialogue. It has to be, we have to, taking the phrase from the title of your program, we have to be rich in relationship uh, with each other. And that means listening, and it means confronting people who are different and have different ideas than you do, and actually being prepared to learn from whatever their experience has been. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second part of it is about how do you actually ask the questions that are really interesting that move people in the direction of what politics is really about, which is essentially social problem solving. Mm -hmm. So if we think of, of politics as just trying to s uh, solve a problem that affects a lot of people, uh, then what we have to say is everybody's got an angle on it. And for every angle that somebody has, there's a possibility of a better solution. Mm -hmm. So we know that diversity is useful in problem solving. If you have a group of people who all think the same, they'll all come up with the same solution. It's a really boring world too. Very boring, yeah, so, but if we have a <laughs> as, as much as I want everyone to agree with me and live like me, and because I am so right, if everyone were like me, it would be a really boring world, because I'm just not that interesting a guy, if, we, if we're completely honest. Well, you may be interesting, uh, but you're not the only one who's interesting. Right. So well, the proper way of saying it is not, this is right, but this is right for me. Or this feels right to me, uh, looking at it strictly from my point of view. But we are in relationship. So all you have to do is ask, what would happen in your uh, marriage or relationship or family if you tried to do uh, to solve problems the way that we solve them politically. Well, and I would probably argue that in fact that is, there probably is, the reason it's happening politically is because it's probably happening in our relationships one-to-one -one also. I mean, yes. you know, the, it's not like the, the politicians are the bad guys and everyone else is the good guys. These are the people that have been elected into office and they're they're almost mirroring an internal dialogue that other people are having. So please, I'd love to hear more about, about your experience with that. Sure, uh, I, uh, it's, it has been shown that people who grow up in families in which there is a single authoritarian leader are more inclined to support authoritarian leaders politically. Mm. So actually it begins in the family. And um, so a lot of people are operating out of an idea which is, Whoever the political leader is, it's a stand-in for your mom or your dad. Mm -hmm. um, and that set of assumptions hasn't really been challenged. Uh, people haven't really looked at them. Uh, there are expectations that come out of our families of origin. Uh, but most importantly, uh, what we haven't really done is to um, uh, understand that political issues um, are not mathematically um, prone to, uh, as mathematics is, to give a single correct answer. Instead, there are multiple solutions to every political problem that you could think of. One would hope. Yeah, uh, and the same is true in relationships. No single person is completely right about everything. The whole point of a relationship is to be with someone who has a different way of looking at things a different set of skills in solving problems uh -huh. because then you're stronger as a result of that diversity. And in a very similar way, we, we are that socially. Uh, so, but what that means is in order to get to a form of democracy that allows dialogue to take place, we require a higher order of skill. Uh, in, if, we, if we distinguish between three forms of democracy, an authoritarian form, for example, uh, or uh, a kind of legal form and a uh, really uh, sort of substantively democratic form, um, we can look at it this way. Uh, what do you require in order to live in an autocracy, even if it's formally democratic? And the answer is real simple. You just have to know what the leader thinks and be willing to follow orders and not rock the boat. Um, uh, in order to live in a electoral democracy, a formal democracy, you have to be able to look at the issues and decide which one is right, and which candidates you're going to support, um, and then be able to vote. But to live in a 
real, you know, sort of uh, substantive democracy, we require a set of skills in how to handle dissent, mm -hmm. how to negotiate with people who are different from us, how to resolve conflicts, how to negotiate collaboratively. Mm -hmm. Um, all of these sets of how to engage in dialogue and facilitate dialogues. So these are each one requires a higher order of skill. And I think that where we are at right now is um, that we have uh, are being drawn into a lower level of skill than we need in order to solve the problems we now face no, in the nation and in the world. Absolutely. You know, I've heard uh, as a parent, I remember when everyone started getting an award, when all the kids, like there were, competition stopped, right? Everybody was, got an achievement award and because we didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And I remember hearing other parents and thinking myself, well, I can see the strength of this, but the, you know, the sort of the downside is that um, there's no, it's, it's almost like we're trying to eliminate conflict. And, you know, well, and nobody wants to be at war, like nobody wants destructive conflict. But at the same time, you know, I think what I heard you say is that anything creative and new comes out of diversity and the meeting of diverse points of view in constructive conflict. Exactly right. And the phrase that we're now using a lot of us to describe this is generative conflict. Oh, I love that. Yeah, isn't that nice? <laughs> so yeah, my, That is my new, my new my new term, generative conflict. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so here's kind of the way that it works. Um, there, uh, with the kids in the classroom, there are two truths. There are two goals. One goal is to help kids feel good about themselves uh, and not uh, feel that they are bad people because or they less than or or left hand or whatever. And that just means, okay, so you weren't the best at that particular sport, but maybe you'll be good at something else and helping kids find what they are really good at. And then the second part is actually um, uh, uh, striving each of us to be the best at whatever it is that we do that we can possibly be. And that word best means that um, uh, we have to have uh, creative competition, collaborative competition. Mm -hmm. and if you think about it, every serious competition is collaborative because we've already had to agree on a set of rules for the competition. Exactly. You know, there, there are rules for every race that you run, for whatever, and those are collaboratively created. And we want those to be fair, uh, meaning usually equal. Uh, but what we haven't really necessarily acknowledged is, um, or, or done very much with, is we have, we've got a great contest for physical strength and physical endurance and physical speed. Uh, and we have a few things for mental uh, uh, agility uh, and mental speed, some kinds of contests, spelling bees and things of this sort. Mm -hmm. But we haven't got anything for emotional agility uh, for emotional competence. Uh, and we haven't got anything really even for what we could refer to as spiritual or heart-based uh, competence. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are others as well, uh, in addition to those. So what's important, I think, is to have a kind of approach that says that there are multiple forms of intelligence. And uh, we each have a different combination of those. Yeah, so, no. Um... I've met people with who were top of their class at Harvard, and yet who, with all their intellectual brilliance, uh, have achieved less than perhaps they would have liked to in life because they didn't understand the emotional side and how to interact emotionally. And I've met people who have massive emotional intelligence um, and per, and have maybe less on the intellectual side, but because they know how to connect with people and relate to people, They've, and because they understand their own limitations and how to work with people who have strengths where they don't have been mm -hmm. massively successful. So I totally, I totally get what you're talking about there. And so um, how does this idea of generative conflict show up in, in let's say, in a marriage relationship or with sure. uh, parenting or in these arenas? 
Well, they, uh, it, it, it shows up in a variety of different ways, uh, but I think we can see that in, in the first place, it shows up in every conflict. So here is a very broad description of what I think conflict is, having spent now 40 years you know, mediating. Um, and I think that this kind of describes you know, a, a very simple way of looking at it. Um, if you think about who doesn't get into conflicts, we can describe two groups of people. Uh, in the first place, there are no two-year-olds who experience conflicts over romantic love. Why? They're not ready yet. Second, we can assume that there are no 60-year-olds who experience conflicts with their parents over curfew. Why? Because they've already figured out how to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. So what conflicts do we actually get? And I think the answer is defined by two things. On the one hand, by a problem that we are now required to solve in order to learn and grow and become who we actually are. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, by the fact that we do not yet have the skills we need in order to solve it. And so what happens is we tend to get into relationship with people who have skill sets that we don't, uh, who are strong in places where we are weak, mm -hmm. who look at the world in slightly different ways, because together we are able to, to approach problems in the world uh, much, much better. Uh, and we feel kind of whole, uh, like you know, more whole than we do when we are alone. Uh, oftentimes in those relationships. So those are, uh, but uh, uh, the difficulty is that everybody who's different from you, that's a possible source of conflict. Uh -huh. So how do you turn it in a generative direction? And I think the first answer to that is by not assuming that there is a single correct answer, that one person is right and the other person is wrong. Instead, and then of course, that's exactly what happens in divorce is that polarization happens. But if instead we are able to ask what is right about what the other person is saying, what makes it feel right to them? Under what circumstances would that actually be the best approach? Mm -hmm. And under what circumstances would the approach that I'm suggesting be the best approach? And now can we find a way of combining those two approaches together that yields a higher order Mm -hmm. uh, not so just a transformational, but a transcendent way of addressing that problem. So here's an example. Uh, there are two ways of combining things together. First, you can take hot water and cold water and mix them together and get lukewarm water. Mm -hmm. And second, you can take water and flour and heat and make bread. And there, well, you might need a couple more ingredients, but I'm with you. Yeah, you need a few more ingredients, <laughs> a bit of yeast. Uh, but let's just say that we can at least make some kind of something out of I mean. that. Yeah. And so what happens is, if you look at it from the point of view of the water or the flour or the heat, none of them can imagine the bread. Mm -hmm. uh, the hot water can imagine something lukewarm, and the cold water can as well. But what we've created when we make bread is something brand new something that scientists call an emergent phenomenon. It emerges out of the combination of complex, you know, very, very different things. Um, and so that's the place where the conflict becomes generative. It leads us to higher order relationships. Someplace new and not imagined. Yeah. And I, I love so, that. I mean, have you, ever, have you ever had a pastry and wondered how the heck somebody invented that thing? You know, and and that all the trial and error that must have gone into first the crust and then the yeah. the glaze and then the so I yeah that makes perfect sense right so when we go back to relationships so for a second there it sounded like we were going to you know everyone gets an achievement award because we're going to acknowledge everyone's point of view but I like the way you qualified that with well they're right in a specific context right in a specific context and what's really interesting about that is when you look at how people get to come together. You know, they're set, when people first meet and they fall in love and they see stars and everything's wonderful, there's that, there's that sense that when that person sees you as someone you never imagined yourself as being. 
and yeah. you feel like so much more of a person in that person's presence and vice versa. And that's part of the whole being in love experience. Now that's statistically last two to three years. So, and then, you know, typically by that point, people have children, life gets very normal. They develop systems in order to, to manage life. And then they, people tend to fall into kind of a parallel life track because, you know, you're all doing, you're working with your strengths. All right, I'm really good at feeding the kids. You're really good at getting them to school. I'm really good at making money here. You're really good at building these relationships. You know, and so it, it becomes a great team effort, but the relationship itself may suffer in that time period because everyone's so focused on doing what they're individually good at. And so what I'm curious about is, what I hear you saying though, is there's, there's still that possibility of experiencing yourself as that person that when you were in love, that person who they saw you of, saw you as, and that person who you saw them as, that possibility is still there. I'm, I'm curious, how do you see the, tr there you are, you're living those potentially parallel lives, living in your individual strengths, your unified strengths maybe aren't showing up so much, except that you're a great sort of tag team wrestling team. You know, in tag team wrestling, I don't know if you've ever watched that menagerie, but it's pretty interesting. <laughs> Usually one person's in there and the other one's out. And the other person who's in there says, man, I'm tired, slap, you're in. Every now and then they get in there and beat on someone together illegally for the <laughs> joy of the audience. But, but you know, it's pre that's pretty rare. How do you get it so that you're moving out of that tag team parallel life thing to where you're being generative again? Well, this is difficult when you have kids uh, because uh, the kids tend to, you know, sort of uh, uh, set the stage for what they need uh, to satisfy their interests. And they are primary. I mean, they are a covenant. Of, they are a covenant above all things. Yeah, and we love them, and so we do all kinds of things for them. Instinctual. Yeah. So here's. I think there are several things that are needed. Uh, the first thing that is needed is to actually stop um, and reflect on where you are in the relationship periodically. Mm. Um, once a year, New Year's Eve, um, uh, every six months, every month, you know, whatever it might happen to be. And the basic form of that is for one person to turn to the other person and ask, um, how are we doing? How am I doing? What is one thing I could do that would make this relationship work better for you? Mm -hmm. And now would you like to hear one thing I think you could do that would make it work better for me? Uh, the second piece of it is, um, and this is a little bit about uh, a, a kind of phrase, which is, um, uh, I was so busy chopping wood, I didn't have time to stop and sharpen the ax. Uh. So you're, you're so busy taking care of the kids, you haven't got time to stop and actually improve your relationship with them or your relationship with the other person who's caring for them, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And then what happens is a lot of stuff gets swept under the rug and the larger that little bump becomes under the rug, the more difficult- Easier it is to trip over. Yeah. yeah. So you trip over it and then you become frightened of picking up the rug because there's so much underneath it. Yeah. Uh, but you have to really at some point pick it up uh, and look underneath and, and then to own the parts that you have contributed. So in every relationship, it's not 50-50. It's 100%, 100% mm -hmm. or it isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. So if you say, well, 50% of the love has to come from the other person, it doesn't work that way. Uh, you have to be ready to give 100% of the love that is inside of you. Or if you're withholding it, you have to ask yourself the question, why? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the answer to that is either there is some need that I have that the other person is not recognizing. Or number two, there is some conflict that we are experiencing and are stuck in and don't know how to get out of. And we're gradually getting worn down and exhausted by this uh, 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 chronic conflict. And then what is necessary is to stop and say, how do we do that? How do we figure out how to make this work? And then we can come back to what is one thing I can do that would make this you know, relationship work better for you or questions like that. I think it's also important to track things back to your family of origin. Yeah, not just one, not just one generation. I, I, uh, I'm a follower of uh, Pete Scazzaro, who has this emotionally healthy relationship program, also spirituality. But hmm. Pete, Pete's very big on a multi-generational approach 
to, yes. to looking at how we behave in relationships. And it's interesting, I, I did the work with him where I did the, my family tree, and I could actually see how decisions that were made several generations up were influencing me today. It's like when you really look at it, where the, the functions and dysfunctions are, you can see a direct chain right from your, your great grandparents, your grandparents, to your parents, to you. It's yeah. actually amazing. And it takes the whole idea of, uh, of generational sin you know, and makes it something real and relatable instead of being sin, which has got a stigma around it. It's like, no, these are behaviors that my family has had that's been passed on from generation to generation. And it becomes completely, uh, then, then you can actually wrap your mind around it and maybe make, make some shifts and adjustments. Yeah, the, they, yeah, go ahead. I, well, I, I was going to say that I, we, we, I, we try to limit the podcast to 20 minutes, and I, I actually, I, I could go on for, for like another 20, um, but I, I love talking to you. I love your depth and breadth, and who knew you were also a relationship coach? Yeah. <laughs> I, um, it's not in I, your bio. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious, um, in terms of the, the audience, uh, is there... Are there any projects or is there any work you'd like us to know about before, before we wrap this up for the people who listen to this while they're driving or on a treadmill or whatever? Yeah, I would say that the, probably the most, some of the most interesting and powerful work that I'm doing is using a conflict resolution tool, which is called Conflict Resolution Systems Design. I'm going to write that down. Okay, conflict <laughs> resolution systems design, and I wrote it about about it in several of the books that I've written. One is called Resolving Conflicts at Work. There's a whole chapter on systems design. I've written about it in a book on politics and political conflicts, called Politics uh, Dialogue and the Evolution of Democracy. There's a section in there on systems design, uh, and a book that I wrote called The Dance of Opposites. Uh, there are several books I've written about it. Uh, in any event, what it is, is looking at the system and trying to design the elements of a system that is going to work for you. And so I work with couples mm -hmm. uh, to figure out, okay, uh, have you had any conflicts with each other? Yes. Um, what is one thing that happened in that conflict that you would prefer never to experience again? Mm. Okay. Can we reach an agreement that neither of you are going to do that? And it sounds very simple, but it actually becomes very, very rich uh, and successful. Um, and a second part of this is to go deeper, to redesign the systems design process itself, uh, so as to include heart-based questions. Because when we think about systems design, we think about it more or less mathematically yeah. or structurally. So sort a of very left brain intellectual. Yeah. So here's another piece, a set of questions you can ask. Um, uh, what is one thing that you uh, would like to acknowledge the other person for? What is one, the thing that you would most like to be acknowledged by them for? Um, uh, what is one thing that you'd like to apologize for that you have done in the past that you are prepared to now say that you would not uh, you think was unsuccessful and you'd like to not do that again and was that the apology you wanted to the other person uh what is the apology that you would really like to hear this person say to you mm. and are you willing to say that and on a scale of one to ten ten being highest how would you rank that apology right so these are ways of building into the relational system acknowledgement apology forgiveness uh reconciliation uh, heart-based questions that invite people to talk about what they love about each other. Um, and those are the things that really matter, that they really care about, and that they're afraid of because it, they mean so much to them, mm -hmm. and therefore they don't ask them. Great stuff. And uh, one last question. Uh, what is the legacy that you would like to leave behind you as sort of a thought leader in the realm of relationships and mediation? I would say that it is um, uh, the importance of um, digging beneath the surface and discovering what is taking place at a deep level um, within the conflict. 
Uh, so oftentimes I find in relational conflicts especially, there are the superficial issues that people are fighting over. And beneath that are a set of interests. And beneath that are a set of underlying needs and desires. Mm. And beneath that are a set of fears mm -hmm. about what would happen and how am I really treated by the other person. And beneath that are a set of self-doubts about ourselves um, that we oftentimes externalize onto other people. And so digging deeper is the thing that I would say is the big and important part of relationship building. Always dig deeper. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I'm sorry this went so quickly. Maybe we can do this again sometime. Love to. Okay. Oh, thank oh, you. Before you go. Yes. If people want to learn more about your work. Where is there a website they should go to? Uh, how would you like them to reach out to you? Yeah, it's www.kencloak.com. Uh, -E. Got it. And I'll make sure that that is on the resource page. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much.